Okay, well, thank you guys for being here. To start on our conversation with kind of the bridge between private sector and public sector, the first question I want to pose to all of you is, can you start with a brief overview on your journey to Google from the public sector? Would you start? Sure, and thank you so much for having us here. It's great to be with this incredibly uh, diverse and vibrant audience for this event. Um, so my path to Google is a bit winding. I started my career as an Army officer a long time ago, went to law school, then worked in industry for a while, in government for a while, and then came here to Google because my expertise as a government contracts lawyer is helping a company in the private sector sell to the public sector. Okay, fantastic. Next. Again, thank you for having us. <laughs> yes. um, my name is Jared Bomberg. I work on uh, Google's uh, uh, public policy team. I work primarily on privacy and data security matters, and focusing a lot on what's coming to what's coming at Google in terms of new legislative and regulatory proposals. I came from the U.S. Senate, where I led the Senate Commerce Committee subcommittee on consumer affairs for Chairwoman Cantwell, and so in that role, we were writing proposed legislation to regulate tech companies and other data collectors. Um, prior to that, I uh, was a, a lawyer in private practice for a couple different law firms in DC helping clients think through compliance obligations related to privacy and data security law. Thank you, and Stacy. Thank you, so my pathway is a little windy as well. Um, business majors will appreciate that um, I, I came in with a global cybersecurity company called Mandiant, which was acquired by Google last fall. So we are now under the Google family with uh, my new colleagues here. But um, I started my career in Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill. That's where I cut my teeth um, in the city. And since then, have had a number of roles in public policy and strategic communications, both for the Department of Defense and Department of of Homeland Security, um, and I left the Hill to go to DHS shortly after the department was stood up. Um, I knew that I wasn't gonna go into the military, but I felt that um, as, as far as contributing to that public service mission, that was the best place to start given the events at the time. And thank you so much for that. So I'll jump straight into personal questions. Each of you have worked in the public sector, but doing slightly different things. So I'd like to highlight that and really just gain your insight onto those different aspects that you worked in. Um, Philip, we'll start with you. Can you please give some insight into the relationship between the private and public sectors in terms of technology sharing and how this sharing boosts national security, not only for the United States, but for all members of the NATO alliance? It's a great question, and um, I'd tie it back to the last video that talked about the um, imperative for government to work with civilian markets, because that's really where a lot of the innovation and activity is from a research and development perspective. Um, US. Uh, former Deputy Secretary of Defense Bob Work said it well in his third offset strategy and a couple of other documents. He wrote that um, 50 years ago, the Defense Department could buy whatever it wanted in Silicon Valley, and it could tell Xerox or uh, any other company what it wanted to build and what it wanted to research. That's no longer true. Mm -hmm. The locus of innovation has shifted to the private sector. Commercial markets are orders of magnitude larger than any government's buying power, and as a consequence, um, governments, particularly national security agencies, really have to work more and more with the private sector to get the kind of cutting edge technology they're going to need, whether it's to um, serve financial markets in New York or serve on battlefields in places to be determined. And so I think um, there is increasing opportunity to work at the intersection of those two and to be part of the organization that can um, sort of understand how to translate across that divide and get the best of both worlds. Thank you so much. And Stacy, I'll go to you. Can you please briefly describe how the industry works with governments to protect cybersecurity, as well as your personal experience working with NATO, especially on Ukraine? Yeah, sure. So Ukraine is an obvious relevant example today. Um, you know, to your point, Phil, this is not the first time that the private sector has contributed during wartime. Um, industry has provided tanks, artillery over, over time, but this is the first time that we are providing support to a cyber component of a war, and we've certainly been doing that from the very beginning um, and working very closely with NATO um, and alliance members. And, this past fall, my colleagues and I were meeting with the mission to Ukraine at, at NATO headquarters, and um, it was a tense time, a tense moment. Um, you know, we're dealing with an actual war here, um, and it was kind of quiet in the room, and um, all of a sudden, you know, one of the gentlemen kind of looked at us, you know, made direct eye contact and said, well, 
Mandiant was with us in the very beginning of the war, and if it weren't for you, we would have fallen to the Russians. So talk about <laughs> a mission moment, um, not only from a personal contributor, but also just it was kind of an inflection point for what this concept of public-private sector collaboration and partnership really means. Um, and to that end, you know, it, it really highlighted that industry had been there supporting Ukraine and working with the alliance to do so. And we've seen three different ways to do that. Um, kind of emerged since the war started. So the first is around direct commercial support. So companies like Mandiant, other cybersecurity firms, IT uh, companies were providing direct commercial support, not only to Ukraine, but to Alliance members as well. So also before the war and then during the war, which is very helpful because we could activate very quickly and get those services and solutions as fast as possible. The second is around the multilateral, multinational um, engagement. So you know, we've been asked to go to NATO headquarters and share our observations of what we're seeing in Ukraine. What are the lessons learned? What are the best practices? How do we work together within the international community to help defend Ukraine in the short term, but then also think about what cyber defense assistance looks in the long term? And then finally, you had this vertical of an esprit de corps so again, other cybersecurity like-minded companies like Mandiant came together very quickly um, and at scale was able to provide support into, uh, into Ukraine and alongside Alliance members. Thank you so much. Jared, I'll go to you. So your background really is in data privacy policy. You worked on the Senate and all that good stuff. So can you share your thoughts and input on privacy policy in the U.S. as well as greater NATO and the line between privacy and national security? Yeah, sure. And, you know, it's a, it's a big question. We can right. probably spend all day on it. And this is going to be sound slightly different from the, the, the conversation that you were just having with my mm -hmm. colleagues. But, you know, the line between privacy and national security is really drawn by governments um, directly or mm -hmm. in, in collaboration with one another. So um, in the U.S., for instance, it takes different forms. Like um, the government has different ways of obtaining data about individuals. It could buy data on the open market. It could use data that it has through government services, whether that's by you know, using driver license information mm -hmm. um, or benefit information. Um, and then, of course, there's uh, surveillance um, that could occur through legal means. Um, and so Google, for instance, has a transparency report, report like many companies, that details um, how many law enforcement access requests we get each year. And so that line between privacy and, and national security is really different um, in each country. And there are ways to um, make it harder to reach over that line to grab that information. Mm -hmm. For instance, by erecting additional judicial and legal barriers. Um, there's ways to do it from the sort of private sector side or the consumer side by minimizing the data that's collected or giving consumers more control over their information. Mm -hmm. And so um, that line can be breached, but um, depending on the, the corpus of data that's collected, there may or may not be the data that's needed, um, which gives individuals more privacy protections um, and makes the government think um, even more sort of uh, strategically about what it needs and what it's asking for. So for instance, with Google, when there's a law enforcement access request or a national security access request, we will make sure that first it complies with all legal uh, processes, second, that it's tailored to the information that is needed, and third, we'll notify users unless we're told not to. Okay, fantastic. And a question that I'll pose to the group before um, we take questions from the audience is, what is one skill or experience that you gained from working in the public sector that has helped you to excel in your current roles at Google? Um, Philip, would you like to start? And we'll go to Thinking back on what's the funniest or uh, <laughs> Uh, most dramatic story I can tell, but I, I think it's probably the Army experience that I fall back on the most. It's thinking about hard things I've done in hard places when I've been tired and the people around me have been tired and I've learned to sort of calm down and think about how do we prioritize, how do we share information as much as possible, how do we get everyone into the fight so they can bring what they have to bear. And it really sort of reflects our culture at Google, ironically, where we see inclusivity as a way to make sure that every mind in the room is focused on the problem and solving the problem, and everyone has a chance to contribute. And if we step back and calmly evaluate a problem, we can usually solve it, um, but you can't lose your head. You have to really focus on um, staying calm and solving the problem in a very methodical way. And you know, it's ironic that I would learn that in the chaos of combat, but 
it, it has paid dividends ever since, and it still does today at Google. Fantastic. Jerry? Yeah, I think chaos takes many forms. So just to like piggyback off of that point, I, you know, one skill that I think has really helped me from the public sector, which is learning how to work in a chaotic environment and learning and really focusing on collaboration and creativity to solve problems. And you know, working in the Senate, I've worked in the Senate for 10 years, getting a, a, a bill into law with 100 senators with 100 different points of view, you know, 10 times that number of staff is very difficult. And you've got to be really creative and um, look forward to finding ways to find consensus. And in some ways, the work that we do, that I do at Google, is similar. It, Google's a, a big organization, right? Mm -hmm. um, 175,000 or so employees. Mm -hmm. uh, it, there's a, a lot of different views um, when it comes to public sector engagement. And you've got to work with colleagues from around the world to try to solve problems that that um, can sort of scale at a global level. I think we have seven different products with over a billion users. Um, so the type of um, problem solving that we're doing has to work in so many different environments, and, and that forces you to collaborate um, if you're gonna get something done. So uh, chaos in different forms, maybe not as dramatic <laughs> as, as Phillips. <laughs> Thank you, and Stacy. Yeah, I don't think I'll embarrass myself with any like hard lessons learned, but. I think when I was 22 on the Hill, I had a staff director who was a dear friend and mentor until the day I lost him, sadly, not too long ago. But um, one of the first things he ever said to me was, um, Stacey, you got to work smart, not hard. And I just thought that that was so ridiculous. What do you mean, don't work hard? Of course, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to go get them. Um, but, you know, and he never really fully gave me an explanation until like years later, we would meet every few months and we would talk about what he meant. And what he was really talking about was being resourceful and thinking about how to maximize um, your network around you and your relationships. Um, and this is, they're exactly right, you know, doing this at Google, you can absolutely apply this within, within the public sector as well. It's about diplomacy, it's about consensus building. And so you do need to um, consider all sides and be able to come together to come up with something that's gonna be feasible and, and move out to, to meet those objectives. But the second important piece to all of that as well is communications. I, I mean, I can't stress that enough, but or, both oral and written communications. And that's being able to suss out how to communicate with people that you are engaging with at all levels, whether it's someone who's working for you, whether it's your boss, whether it's a three-star general uh, or a deputy secretary, um, whatever the case may be, you have to be able to think critically about what your objective is in those moments, and you also have to be able to do it on the fly. So I would say practice um, developing and exercising your network as much as possible, but then also um, honing in on those communication skills is key. So keeping calm in chaos, collaboration, <laughs> and communication, major takeaways. At this time, we'll open the floor for questions. If you guys would like to stand up, go ahead. Hi, I'm Will Monahan. I'm an intern at the Center for European Policy Analysis and a student at Duke University. Uh, my question, uh, Jared, you mentioned that governments uh, define the line between privacy and national security. How does Google decide when a government's definition of that line is incompatible with its obligations to its users and its values as a company? So you know, first, it starts with, with the legal analysis. You know, what, what does the law say? And then it's uh, looking at what the request is. And if the request is overbroad, then we'll do our best to narrow that request, including going to court to fight it. Um, and when it's in line with legal um, um, procedures and standards, then um, we'd of course comply with those obligations. So um, I, think it's a, I think it's a really good question. I think um, in, in sort of theory it could be difficult, but I think in practice it, it can be fairly straightforward. Thank you, thank you for taking the time to be here. Thank you. Hello, my name is Enya. I'm a student at William & Mary and I'm working at the Global Research Institute this summer. From your perspective in the private sector, how do you see emerging technology in space and cyber changing not only the nature of warfare as well as peace building? Thank you. Stacey? Yeah. 
<laughs> Sorry, um, goes to you. <laughs> start with, I, I know both of you are just shooting down here. Um, no, I mean, look, it's an important question. We were talking about this during the previous panel on I.O. as well. Emerging tech is going to play such an important role in the entire community, right, in the digital ecosystem. And it's thinking about ways to ensure that that ecosystem is safe, but that we can also exploit those technologies in a way that's going to help us. But we need to do it securely and safely um, and include privacy as well that's always going to be a major component to any of these technologies um, but it's really taking the time um, to do it thoughtfully and diligently so that we're we're not doing it's the first you know goal should be do no harm you know so how can we leverage these technologies that are going to promote democratic values that are going to keep us together in, in instead of separating us um, and we have a long way to go. I mean, the technology is moving at such a rapid pace. Threat actors are moving at such a rapid pace. Um, we're, not, we're not dealing with one-off cyber attacks anymore. We're dealing with persistent, long-term campaign from nation states. You have criminal gangs who are backed by nation states. Um, so trying to, to marry or keep up with the pace of technology, the pace of our threat actors is very difficult to do. But it's so important that you have forums like this, that you're including the public and private sector and research and academia to contribute to those conversations. Great, thank you. Um, we're gonna take a question from online. It says, Ukraine has been a case where the private sector has not only provided unprecedented tech support, but has also taken the lead in doing so voluntarily. And for future potential conflicts, example, the Taiwan Strait, where the natural incentives may be different, how can the government help incentivize and direct the private sector and Wall Street to support the mission? That's a, it's a good question, and, and I'm not sure that it's completely true that industry has acted altruistically in Ukraine. I think the US has provided, and NATO also, billions upon billions of dollars in loans, guarantees, and direct funding for a lot of that effort. And I think that's more reflective of the Western way of war, which is distinct, candidly, from some of our adversaries, where um, Russia and China may have national industries that procure goods and do so um, at cost for the government. The Western way of war for at least 100 years has been for industry to do so on a contract basis, whether it's for the UK government, the German government, or the US government. And I, I think we'll see that model uh, continue and probably improve and if anything, what we'll see are more um, interwar collaborations that span the interwar period and just don't wait for the, the moment of conflict to come into being, but have very close partnerships during peacetime so that the government knows how to work with a company like Google or a company uh, in another sector that's doing incredible space stuff so that um, they're always ready. Fantastic. Yeah, I just want to double tap on that too. I mean, that's important. So there's two important points. First is having those relationships in place prior to conflict is incredibly important, as I mentioned, so you could activate very quickly. Um, but the incentives are a little different too. It's not going to be an equal comparison to what we're seeing in Ukraine and what we might see with China and Taiwan. The motivations of companies are going to be different. You have to bear in mind that businesses are, are trying to make a profit, right? So we right. have to think about what type of, of business is being conducted by which which type of companies in China and what might they be incentivized to do and, and how far would they be willing to take that support, uh, which is why it's been so helpful talking to NATO um, as well as our, um, our US government colleagues here at the State Department and the Department of Defense for Cyber Policy, thinking about what does a long-term cyber defense assistance program look like and what is the role it, of the private sector in contributing to that fund? How can we activate collectively very quickly? Um, so we have a long way to go. This is, um, this, is a, this is a first in many ways and we can draw parallels to prior conflicts, but we have a lot of learning to do together. Right, thank you. We'll take another question from the room. Hi, my name is Joseph Waymeyer. I'm a student at William & Mary. I was just curious about your guys' career paths. Um, as a student, and I'm sure many others in the room are interested in both public and private sector work. I know you guys have all worked in the public se sector. I was curious, when did you guys decide was the time to pivot from public sector to private sector and why? Um, I'll start, honestly, I went to the private sector because I wanted to get a graduate degree paid for. <laughs> and at the time, the Hill didn't pay for master's programs. 
Um, so I, I left the Hill to go into the private sector to get them to pay for my degree, which they did. Um, and then I spent some time at DHS, but this is kind of what I meant when I said earlier about um, developing that network. Every job that I've had in the DC area, you could kind of look at that and think, gosh, oh, she's jumped all around. She doesn't really know what she's doing. But every job has been like a building block, one on top of the other, and has brought relevant experiences and perspectives that are so complementary between the public and private sector. Um, the inflection um, between, you know, <laughs> how the government works with private sector and vice versa and the, even the regulatory landscape and, and, and all the things that um, our colleagues here have been discussing around privacy and that it's so important for them to be together. But um, I would say moving in and out of the private sector and, and public sector sometimes is frowned upon in DC, but I think it enriches your experience. Um, and I, I would encourage you to do that. And I would also encourage you to continue to stay in school um, as you go through either of those pathways. So uh, should we just go down the line yeah. a little bit? Sure. Um, so I left the Senate originally after I got a law degree and I wanted to learn how to be a, a real, quote unquote real lawyer. So uh, I, I practiced for a number of years um, to gain those skills. And, um, but just to echo sort of what Stacy was saying, I went back to the Senate and I went, now to Google, and you know, with each step, it's been sort of a, a sort of a career progression, and you learn something along. I learned something along the way in each step, and, and it has certainly helped um, prepare me for this job, which in many ways has a lot of similarities to working um, uh, in a public sector role, where you're working and you've got to think about problems from many different angles. Because as I was talking about before, there's so many people impacted by the decisions. Um, uh, that are made uh, about different products and how they'll be used and what data will be used and when it'll be shared and why it won't ever be sold and what controls people have. Those are very similar sort of global questions to the ones that, that um, I faced in the Senate. And, and I would just add, um, I had a really brilliant boss several years ago, Michelle Flournoy, who is a former senior official at DOD, who gave me lasting advice, actually lots of lasting advice, but two things that really stood out. One, don't pick your job, pick your boss. Um, she was a fabulous boss, but she had also done that really well in her career. And so she knew that having that person shape your daily life mattered a lot, and they would also become your mentors, Stacy, you were describing too. Um, and then second is this whole idea of public and private is sort of blurring more and more. When I look around all my peers, particularly the really successful ones, they just move back and forth, and they're very opportunistic in their careers and they find the next best opportunity that it's a growth opportunity. You know, I think, Stacey, you said it well. And, and so I think that's going to continue for all of you. And I think your career paths are going to be even more complicated, but also rewarding and enjoyable than ours were. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Um, another question from online. So as we saw from the recent TikTok hearings, most of Congress is not up to speed on technology or social media. How do you communicate these issues to our policymakers? And what are the challenges in bridging this generational divide? So do you want to jump in? Should I jump in? Well, <laughs> Go for it. Uh, so um, that, this is my thesis for my <laughs> master's in cybersecurity was about um, Congress's inability to pass meaningful cybersecurity legislation. And that's what I focused on, right? Looking at members of Congress and their staff. And, um, and this is going back prior to TikTok hearings. We've seen this, this happens quite a bit. Um, and I think you got to give a little, bit, a little bit of grace to how the, the legislative branch is constructed and how members are elected into Congress um, and how they're placed on committees. There's some of that. But again, this is where the role of the private sector is very helpful. So um, part of Vandiant has an intelligence arm and we do a significant amount of reporting and we lean forward to be that transparent, um, trusted advisor to members of Congress and their staff to understand um, what the threat landscape is, what are the motivations of the actors, what are some steps that the, the federal government can take and working with, or you know, that Congress can take and working with the administration and working with um, the private sector to um, eradicate or to, to handle some of these really complex problems. Um, but it really is about education because you, you do have a number of members and staff who are very well versed in cybersecurity and IT. Um, but this also goes to like this, the workforce issue within cyber, you know, trying to grow a class of policy and operational professionals in cyber who are interested in doing this in, in this realm. 
Um, so it's, it's complicated, but I would say education is, is the key to helping Congress on these issues. Thank you. We'll take one more question from the room. Good afternoon. My name is Connor Darby. I'm a recent graduate of William & Mary. Now, the three of you are all employees of Google, and in 2018, I believe, um, the, uh, Google was forced to abandon a contract with the Department of Defense, largely because of um, an employee backlash. Now, the three of you are all former public servants, and you all obviously understand the importance of uh, the private sector in enhancing our national security, as I think many of us in this room do. How do we convey the importance of these missions and the importance of these partnerships to uh, those who might not have the same understanding at a company like Google? I'm going to defer to you guys on this one. <laughs> I, do you want to take a stab first, Phil? Sure. I, I, can, I can start by saying that um, you know, Google takes very seriously its, uh, its role as a company and um, the views of its stakeholders that are its employees. And so we value their opinions. We listen to them. We talk to them. We engage them all the time. We, I mean, not to be glib, but we are them too. Um, uh, we also take very seriously our commitments to our customers. We've currently entered into contracts with the U.S. government, including the Defense Department, that we are committed to, that we honor, and that we respect. And what we see is often the need to um, bridge the divide between those to, to articulate, here's how we serve the Defense Department in a way that's consistent with our AI principles, our acceptable use guidelines, and how we want to be in the world. Um, that often is harder to do in theory than in practice. In practice, it's about looking at how we're helping the Army automate email better for junior enlisted soldiers, or how we're helping different parts of the DOD and VA engage better with health records and do so at scale based on our, our cloud capabilities, things like that. And as we focus on those types of use cases, things get a little bit um, more clear. And then I think we also are able to say, you know, even in those hard cases involving the Defense Department, where we might be in a conflict, you know, this is our role as a U.S. company that is supporting the U.S. government, that we are providing them tools so that we can do what our Democrat, democratically elected representatives and president choose to do. And, and it's a conversation that we are ready to have and that we are having as we do this work. Thank you very much. Thank you. And one last question. Um, Considering there's so many young people just starting their careers, are getting ready to start their careers, especially for myself, what is the best piece of career advice that you can give to a young person just starting to figure out what they want to do? No, in a lie. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, it's hard, in part because that makes me recognize my age and think about, <laughs> this is 25 years ago when I started my career. Um, the thing that I am glad that I did now, in retrospect, is recognize that my risk tolerance was a lot higher before I had a family and a mortgage and I was older and I would break more easily. And so I chose to do things in my 20s that I would never choose to do now. I joined the army, I went overseas, I did all these things where failure was a real uh, potential. And I feel like I'm stronger for those things now because I've done them, but I wouldn't have chosen them later in my life. And so I really prioritized those and even deferred things like law school for anyone considering law school in the audience or on stage, uh, I deferred law school in order to do that public service first. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that was the right call, but it's not the one I would have made later in life. Thank you, Jared. Yeah, I think, you know, find the field that interests you, the, the, the field that you think about um, at night and in the mornings and on weekends and the topics that interest you, and then pursue it. And it may be taking a step back um, in your careers if you've already started them, or it may, um, not pay as much as, as another job, but I would say find the field you want to be in and then figure out what you do really well in that field and do that very well. And if you find that field and you find the thing you do well, I think you're going to enjoy what you do and I think you'll probably do very well in it. Thank you. And Stacey? I'm going to cheat and give you two. So I have to, again, double tap on Phil's comment. Um, this is my favorite quote by FDR, um, and I, I say this to myself all the time. Um, when you get to the end of your rope, tie a knot and hang on. Um, you're going to have periods of your career that are crazy and chaotic and it's stuff going on in your personal life and your professional life, but you know, look at it in terms of phases and learning experiences, but just enjoy the ride as much as you can. Um, and the second one is a little more tactical, and this is, and again, my mentor from the Hill 20 some years ago, um, and this stays with me every day, is never assume anything. Um, 
in any situation. Um, even if you think something is, is concrete and cut and dry, um, it's those little assumptions that can get you into uh, a little bit of trouble. So I think always questioning yourself, taking that moment to pause and not react in an emotional way, uh, but more importantly, just considering everything that's going on around you before you make an assumption and take action to do something. Well, thank you all so much. This has been super insightful. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad to have you all here. Thank you. Yeah, thank Thanks. you.